It's been a cold and harsh winter in Baltimore this year, and that's why those first pictures from Miami in spring training look so inviting this time around. And for the birds, as we head south, optimism is probably as high as it's ever been. Not bad, just two and a half hours from winter to springtime, door to door. The Orioles training in a big town, Miami, unlike some teams that train in Fort Myers and Bradenton, although the Orioles have had some trouble in Miami, especially with the stadium. The Orioles have been training at Miami Stadium for over 20 years. Once a minor league show place, the stadium has deteriorated badly. Every year, the Orioles threaten to leave, and then minor improvements are made. Coupled with the stadium is the area it sits in. Near last spring's riots, two fans were shot to death watching a game here last August. Security has been beefed up to stop theft and damage. Nothing was even uh, closer than 65 blocks away from here. A lot of it is exaggerated. It was a rough summer, but uh, hopefully uh, Miami is on its way back. The stadium looks like it's on its way back. Well, the city has uh, just put in about uh, $475,000 worth of improvements. They've started with, uh, with a lighting system, which is in the process of being finished for the first exhibition game on March 13th. And uh, a lot of other things, a little touch up here and there, but uh, we're, uh, we're happy with the stadium, and uh, we're, we're very confident it's going to be an excellent year. Every year you hear the same complaints that spring training is unnecessary, that it's too long, that it's just a publicity gimmick. But ever since John McGraw and Wilbert Robinson began taking teams south some 80 years ago, spring training remains as much a part of baseball as the home run and the seventh inning stretch. Ted Patterson on the scene in Miami. This week, Baltimore's black business community will be asking other blacks to support and channel their purchases to black concerns hopefully to boost sagging sales and cut record unemployment. This may include supporting food stores, restaurants, clothing shops, and places where services are offered like a doctor or lawyer's office. Hub, the black business organization in Baltimore, wants to change an old saying about the way money is spent. They say the money that wakes up in the black community eventually goes to sleep in the white community. We're about doing with this project is see if we can get to stay overnight. And then hopefully, with other emphasis from other groups and other people, we'll be able to get to stay a week, stay a month. Terry Addison is economic development chairman of HUB, and he told me when retail money stays in a community, unemployment is substantially lower. Our research shows that in the Jewish community, money turns over like an average of seven times before it leaves the community. And in the white community, money turns over like an average of five times. And in the black community, there are virtually no turns. It just comes in and goes right out. And what we're about doing is trying to get money to turn in the black community. Of the more than $5 billion spent in Baltimore, $2 billion is spent in the black community. But less than $20 million of that money is spent by blacks with blacks. During the next seven days, businessmen will try to keep most of the money in the black community. I'm Art Norman on the scene in Baltimore. For young people in the 60s and 70s, marijuana was a symbol of protest, a means of escape. But just as the social and political climate has changed in the 80s, so has the use of pot. For the first time in 20 years, marijuana use among teenagers appears to be down. According to a comprehensive five-year study, the number of high school seniors using marijuana in the month before the survey declined slightly, from 39% of the class of 79 to 34 percent of the class of 80. The report was compiled by the University of Michigan's Institute of Social Research based on surveys at 130 high schools nationwide. I think uh, all the news reports and things on TV are starting to show that that uh, drugs is bad and people are starting to uh, react to it now and they're starting to leave it alone. Well, they probably thought it was popular to get into and like be with the crowd now. People are starting to think about themselves now. And staff members say parents are beginning to think for themselves now. I think they've learned a lot in the message that you have to love your child enough to let them hate you. I think they're going through drawers. I think they're going through pockets. I think they're throwing out things. And I think this is great because it gives young people an opportunity to say no to their friends. However, the report says use of at least two drugs increased. Just over 20% of those surveyed said they'd used amphetamines or speed in the last year. And 7% said they'd used quaaludes, a sedative. But cocaine and heroin showed little change. And unlike other recent studies, this report showed no increase in the level of teenage drinking. 
Researchers emphasize that drug use among teenagers remains a serious problem, with two out of three high school seniors saying they have used illicit drugs and two out of five saying they've used drugs other than marijuana. So the news is not that the drug problem is getting better. The news is it stopped getting worse. Derek Blakely, CBS News, Ann Arbor, Michigan. Johnny, you gonna tell me where you want me to cut this? In the middle? Yeah. Huh? All right. Right about here? Yeah. Y'all ready? Yeah. Okay, one, two, three, and the ribbon is... If a woman came to you seeking an abortion, what would you do? Uh, we would try to explain to her uh, her alternatives, the dangers of abortion, and what we could do to help her carry her baby to term. And if she, after hearing that, decided she still wanted to go through with an abortion, what would you do? She would be free to do that. The search continued in an area just off Feather Island, the spot where Kevin McNulty was last seen. But the combination of poor visibility and water temperatures in the 30s made it tough going for the divers. Very cold dark and it's like uh, the bottom's all silty. All you have to do is just rub the, I mean touch the bottom and the silt comes flying up there. The temperature is like uh, 40 degrees at the maximum between 34 and 40 degrees. And it's really, uh, it's, you're fighting the cold, you're fighting the, and you just don't see anything. You gotta do everything by touch. So you're feeling your way along the bottom? Yes, and just uh, one officer will be holding a rope and you'll be uh, holding on to him and the two officers just go down there. It's like a four foot spread each pass back and forth across the road. But regardless of the conditions, divers from the county police were joined today by city fire department divers who volunteered for the job of finding one of their own. He is one of us, so guys volunteer to come out on their own time. I knew him when I was first promoted to a lieutenant at the Stedman Station. He'd come out of fire school, was assigned to my company, but nothing personal, you know, just on the basis of seeing him from day to day at different times. The loss of Kevin McNulty is the second tragedy to strike the McNulty family, a family of professional firefighters in just the last few months. It was mid-January when another son, 28-year-old Michael, was sentenced to three years in Dismas House on a charge of arson. This is Ron Olson on the scene at the Lock Raven Reservoir. First, if you are using a bank or third-party credit card like MasterCharge or Visa, the merchant from whom you bought the item or repairs must be within the state or within 100 miles of your home. Secondly, the amount in dispute must be over $50. If you have a dispute which fits into both of those categories, you must first try in good faith to return the goods or give the merchant a chance to correct the problem. If that is unsuccessful, you may withhold only the amount of the statement in dispute, not the entire statement. State Banking Commissioner Joseph Krauss says the law, which is part of a 1975 amendment to the Federal Truth in Lending Act, is intended to force banks to act as go-betweens for consumers in dealing with merchants. It's the responsibility of the financial institution to resolve the complaint at that point. Uh, what they have to do is they have to investigate, they have to get in touch with the merchant, and they have to make a determination of whether or not the complaint is valid. Uh, if the complaint is valid, uh, what the financial institution will do is to, in effect, send that little sales slip back to the merchant and tell the merchant that uh, there is a problem with the merchandise or the services that the consumer has purchased and that uh, that credit card issuer is not going to bill that consumer for that uh, service or for those goods. Uh, this puts, obviously, the pressure on the merchant to, to work out the situation. So, in effect, it, it, it drops the whole thing back in the lap of the merchant, which is where it should be in the first place, if there is a problem with the goods or services. Well, 
Well, the cold itself just cuts down on everything you can possibly do right away. And after that, your body just doesn't function like you would normally want it to. It cuts down on the time that you can stay under, the amount of air you consume, the amount of cold your body can take. And therefore, that's why I have so many people here. And we decide to shuffle back and forth rather than put a large group of divers in the water at one time. It was last June when Claire Hammer took the law and a paintbrush into her own hands and painted traffic stripes at the intersection of Woodburn and Homeland Avenues near York Road. Cars don't realize that Homeland Avenue turns into Woodburn, and so they accidentally go up the wrong street. And so I figured that this would help. She said children who played along Homeland Avenue were endangered by cars and trucks driving the wrong way on the one-way street. She said traffic signs hadn't been effective and that despite repeated complaints, the city had not painted the traffic lines on the street. So she did it. I think they should be delighted. They can reimburse me for my pain if they'd like. But the city wasn't delighted and immediately sent work crews to black out her white lines. And Mrs. Hammer was told to reimburse the city for that paint job. Today, Mrs. Hammer was summoned into court by the city because she refused to pay the $94.60. A traffic official for the city admitted that part of the $94.60 was overtime pay for the time he spent doing a live interview about the incident on Channel 2's 6 o'clock news. Judge Ciotola, obviously a man of great compassion, ruled that since the city had not submitted any proof that the city owned the street, he could not find Mrs. Hammer guilty of defacing city property. But the judge did lecture her to never again take the law into her own hands. Meanwhile, the city has painted that traffic line that Mrs. Hammer wanted, a yellow one. And they've also installed this caution sign. So the moral of the story is, I suppose, that sometimes you can fight City Hall and win. I'm Jack Bowden on the scene in Gobins. He says he spent $15,000 in attorney's fees fighting the city. He says he spent more days in court than he'd like to count trying to defend his commercial freedom of speech. He's James Crockett, the realtor who put up a for sale sign in the city even though it was against the law. But today, he says he's elated that the fight is over and he's glad he's won. It gives people an opportunity to know where the properties are available and they can negotiate for the sale of the properties. In many instances, real estate people will tell you that there are no houses available in that particular neighborhood except that house, and the owner is asking a certain price, and you must pay that price. Now when signs are posted, you can negotiate. You don't have to take his word for it. Crockett agrees that it was signs like these in the 50s and 60s that caused the block busting, whites abandoning the city neighborhoods to move to the county because blacks might become their new neighbors. But Crockett says people have changed, perhaps even matured. Whites are moving back in the city. Whites and blacks live together, and there's really no need for the sign ban anymore. I have been fighting it personally because the case was filed against my wife and myself about a property we had in 1929, McCullough Street. And I'm glad that the legal battle is over, but now we have to fight a moral battle of getting the mayor and the city administration to sit down with responsible real estate people and to come up with a nice comprehensive plan that's not going to lower the values of property in the city of Baltimore. And that brings us back to 1929 McCullough Street and the sign that started the whole battle and the ironic part of the story. And as you can see, the sign is still here because the house is still for sale. This is Kurt Anderson on the scene at McCullough Street. If we want to go on a trip, we asked Vivi to find out the best places to go, the cheapest places to go, because we're all uh, under uh, Social Security, you know, and we only have a certain amount of money to spend. But she is 
without a doubt, the most wonderful girl that I have ever come in contact with. or to a dead end. If the amount of leads are of a magnitude where he can't handle it himself. Baffling in a sense that it has never been proven that we have a crime committed. We have a child hanging on a fence. A medical examiner indicates that there is no apparent cause of death. Um, we have no readily apparent signs of like homicide. Although we did handle the investigation as if it were a homicide. Nine or thirteen. Mm -hmm. What's confusing, according to the <coughs> sexually immature person, and yet the um, teeth structure. It was a simple message. Prison guards do a dangerous job and want to be paid more than thirteen or fourteen thousand dollars, which is the average salary. Close to 400 angry guards came to Annapolis tonight to participate in the demonstration at the State House. The majority came from the House of Corrections in Hagerstown. We can hear you, you want a pay raise, but everybody wants one. Why are the guards more deserving than some others? We don't feel that we're more deserving, but we're demanding ours, and we feel we're together enough that if we're going to get it one way or the other. What makes you think you could be able to get it? The governor says there, there's no money. Well, we're going to have another mass meeting next week. And we're going to get our raise, or he's going to be without any prison guards, I'll tell you that. The prison guards had some competition from demonstrators protesting cuts in daycare. Earlier, another group protested cuts in the budgets of the predominantly black state colleges. But it was the prison guards who staged the biggest and noisiest protest to date. They entered the lobby of the State House and roared so loud, Governor Harry Hughes could hear them in his second floor office. But he stayed inside and made no comment. The members of the House and Senate were very much aware of the demonstration going on outside. You couldn't help but hear them here in the chamber. But did all the noise do any good? Well, one source on the Appropriations Committee in a position to know what's going on says the chance of a pay raise being improved is still highly unlikely despite the threat of strikes. This is Patrick McGrath on the scene at the State House in Annapolis.